everybody. Welcome. Hey, you see? Glad to hear. Sure about that. I'm Steve Lonson, a pastor of Calvary United Church of Christ here in the city, right? And one of the people who uh, coordinates this program. It's been going on for, I don't even know, 12, 13 years? Uh, Long time. Uh, the first order of business, though, is uh, I cannot be here at the next one in May. Our conference minister is going to be the speaker of the United Church of Christ in this area. So we're looking for someone to be able to record it and to deal with all this stuff, <laughs> as you saw. Um, so if you can, talk to Harry, because uh, he, he can, uh, or, or me, and I can tell you, basically you need an iPad um, that will help you. That does a fine job recording the program. And we record it on our Spirit on Tap Facebook uh, page, Facebook Live. So let me begin, as we always do, with our ground rules for discussion. Uh, and if you could you all punch your uh, stuff, your information of your uh, license, your plate into the kiosk. Yes. Yes. Okay. If you didn't, it's right out the door here, and you, that way you don't you take a parking for me. Okay. Um, there's also a basket for contributions, which we use for variable things um, that we need. But it is a free program, so yeah, there's there's no pressure. Um, our purpose is to gather together in a setting where challenging and complex cu current cultural and religious faith issues are presented, shared, and discussed. We are not here to judge, but rather to create a safe space for a significant conversation. Please be respectful of others and the views they, res they express. There will be a presentation of about 45 minutes to an hour. Uh, the remainder of our time will be used for questions and comments. Although we want to encourage good discussion, please do not dominate the conversation to a point where others are unable to share their thoughts, which means one comment or question uh, per person, and if we get to everybody and you have another one, we'll come back to you. Uh, and we use the microphone, so please don't uh, shout out, okay? Um, yeah, just raise your hand when the, uh, when the presentation is done, and I'll bring the uh, microphone to you. We believe if we hold this format, everyone will leave here enriched. We would like to thank the uh, Doubletree Hotel, which is the number one ranked Hilton um, hotel in the world for the entire family of Hilton Hotels. Right here in Reading, we're so happy about that. They offer this venue for free. Uh, they sponsor us uh, by letting us use this equipment. Um, and it's a great gift in which we are very uh, grateful to them. Uh, so now I would like to introduce uh, Reverend Dr. Harry Serio, who will introduce our speaker. Thank you, Sid. <coughs> I've been waiting you know, quite a while for this uh, presentation because I've known uh, Dale Graff for many years, and not only in the context of our spiritual exploration project, but also through the Academy of Spirituality and Consciousness Studies. Uh, and he is a member of a lot of other uh, organizations as well. Uh, Dale Graff is a uh, retired aerospace engineer physicist uh, who uh, actually during the Cold War uh, on behalf of the uh, federal government uh, initiated a project called the Stargate and he's going to tell you more about uh, that, uh, that project uh, in his presentation. Uh, we were kind of joking a little earlier uh, that they actually made a uh, motion picture about uh, Project Stargate, didn't call it that. And um, uh, Dale Graff uh, is uh, also uh, the man who stared at goats, <laughs> although he never stared at a goat, I don't think, right? <laughs> I'll try. Uh, remember that film by uh, George Clooney, because George Clooney is a comedy, and uh, it really stretched the imagination. Uh, but uh, Dale will tell us more about uh, his project and about remote viewing and uh, what it is involved in. Uh, I'm sure that you will have questions and uh, comments uh, and we'll have time afterwards to uh, uh, listen to them. Dale? Okay. Thank you, Harry, Steve, 
and also the spirit of town people that organized the uh, events that we did. So I'd like to share here every month. Oh, fine. <clears throat> Uh, <clears throat> when I was checking the chaos out here, I, the first time I used that, so I had to be given instructions on how to plug in my license plate number. And the license plate I have on the car I drove today is one PSI. <laughs> so the person behind me said, that's an odd number, one pounds per square inch. I said, no, that's not what I mean by, by PSI. <clears throat> but I mean by size. Or PSI. <clears throat> it's the 23rd letter of the Greek alphabet. I'm sure most of you know that one, that part of it. But we also use this symbol in the parapsychological community to represent a known feature or quality that we have. Um, the medical ability, and sometimes it's referred to as ESP, or sometimes in older terms, clairvoyance. But in recent years, uh, a new term has come into the picture called remote viewing. And uh, I'll be talking about the origin of that and also the program that I eventually became uh, involved in. <clears throat> now, in, underneath the, the definition of psi and remote viewing specifically, we, made, we created that term in 1972 uh, to kind of break away from the older term. Many times, if you want to start a new endeavor, you change the name. Now, we did change the name for what used to be called clairvoyance uh, because what we did was uh, adapt a different <coughs> technique for experiencing this ability that some people call ESP, extrasensory perception, which is the ability basically to access information that you should not be able to access. It's uh, extrasensory in nature. Dr. Ryan down at Duke University was the, one of the foremost researchers in the early part of that uh, era of studying human potential. So we adapted the term remote viewing and the variations to that. One of them is extended remote viewing, and that refers to the ability of relaxing and perceiving information that you normally would not have any means of knowing, but it's in a relaxed state, not in a more uh, awake conscious state, which is where uh, remote viewing, um, the remote viewing technique is applied. Occasionally, in the program that I'll be discussing, people did have precognitive dreams, and we factored that into the, the data or the information that we were receiving, wherever it was feasible. And also lucid dreaming, for some of you might be aware of that, is a, a state of dreaming when you know that you are actually aware of dreaming. Now, let's begin the, the main part of this work began in 1972 at Stanford Research Institute. This is physicist Russell Clark and Hal Puddock. And they started looking into the phenomenon just, just because it was uh, an interesting thing to do. There was nothing really pushing it other than their curiosity. Uh, they were physicists and they thought there, need, there needed to be scientific, a scientific approach applied to this mental ability that many people talk about and usually experience don't uh, discuss it too openly. Their work from 1972 to 1976 became published in this book called Mind Reach, Scientists Look at Scientific Ability. And in that book, there are a number of examples. Uh, it represents about four to five years of serious scientific research. I'll just do one example to illustrate what we're talking about when we study remote viewing. Typically, an individual is in the laboratory in a, a uh, isolated room, they're noise free, no distraction. Uh, either he's relaxed, he or she is relaxed, <clears throat> and has to describe where a friend of his is traveling or what somebody is looking at at some distant location. The information is recorded uh, and then compared to ground truth <clears throat> after everything is, is verified and put into a file. So there's no way that anybody would ever say there was cheating or collusion being the person that was out there somewhere and any individual in the laboratory that was trying to describe where that person is. So this simple example shows an individual that was in Los in New Orleans, a thousand miles away, the person in the laboratory had been sketched down there, he thought it was a large UFO, didn't, and 
didn't really call it that per se, but that's what he thought it was, but it wasn't, it was the Superdome. But it just gives an example of how people can perceive images and sketch them, even though know, the object or the place that they want to have you describe is thousands of miles away. <clears throat> so this led to looking at it in a more serious manner. Those were experimental things in the laboratory. Then we had an individual about 1973, 1974 appearing scene, Patrick Price. Now he was a former policeman, and uh, he had a reputation in you know, in Los Angeles of always being a step ahead of the of the, of the criminals. Uh, he showed up one day in the laboratory, which is located in Menlo Park, California, and said, hey, I can do these things I see reading, I'm reading about in the San Francisco paper. I can describe this and things too. So they put him to the test, and sure enough, uh, he was able to describe really distant scenes in great detail just by simply relaxing and being asked, okay, describe the place of X, Y, Z, whatever the human was used at the time, either a coordinate or some abstract method. Again, in the blind, don't apply. The CIA learned about that <clears throat> and provided about a year's worth of research money to SRI for them to continue that work. A short time later, the SRI <clears throat> dropped it for political reasons, and the, the SRI research team, Russell and Hal, came to the pleasure I was employed, which was here at the Foreign Technology Division in Dayton, Ohio. And at that time, I was in, I was a, an analyst, uh, trying to determine what the Soviet Union was doing in terms of missiles and airplanes, uh, currently and up to 10 years in, in the future. And while I was in this position, this analytical position, I published a book because something came to my attention about Soviet work at ESP that I thought would be of interest to the commander. Now, this is an awful looking cover. I had to get this from the, F, the Freedom of Information Act. This is a book I wrote, and it, it has the details of the Soviet work in, in the field. So this got into the uh, intelligence circuit, and uh, ultimately it led to support of continuing the research at SRI which the Air Force funded from 1978 to 1980. And it also was instrumental in initiating an operational unit by the Army at Fort Lee Burrow. And the purpose of setting up this program, which eventually became known as Stargate, which was involving the remote viewing phenomenon, was really to what is going on in the Soviet Union, can be explored the phenomenon deeper from a physics point of view, because this was really uh, started off in a physics laboratory. Does it have anything to do with extended human potential? And if it does, can this be applied for intelligence data collection? So the two parts of the activity that then emerged that became the government program called Stargate. Well, the first is the research, and that started in 1972 continued on to the end of the program in 1995. The application part, which is specifically Stargate, and Stargate is a code word. It's a word, it's a word that I actually created and got approved through the Secretary of Defense. But the application started uh, in 1977-78 by the Air Force, and I was involved in that. It was picked up by the Army in 1979 and continued on to 1985 when it was transferred to the Defense Intelligence Agency in Washington, D.C., where I already had been transferred to earlier, a few years earlier. Um, it was condensed by the DRA, <clears throat> the Defense Intelligence Agency, 1985 to, 1990, to, to 1995. And the Defense Intelligence Agency is the overall manager of all the Department of Defense Intelligence activities. Now, we, this was not a program that was totally in the dark, even though it was um, really secure. It was under a special access label. But we had to go through the Secretary of Defense or his deputy. Uh, we had to have approval by the House and Senate Intelligence Committees. Uh, we had to adhere to DOD human use requirements, the Industrial Review Board, and a whole slew of Department of Defense scientific oversight panels. Uh, this was actually a, a major activity throughout the years of the program between 1972 and 1995. So we had annual approval. Now, 
the unit, the operational unit, the people that were identified as those that would attempt to apply remote viewing on an operational task. It's located here at Fort Meade in these little, little barracks. And we love this place, because who would ever think of looking here for an activity like we were doing? Um, it's an Army unit in an Army facility. Later on, the, the Defense Intelligence Agency rented it from them, but it was consolidated. But this is the building where eventually I was assigned, became chief of the unit, and it's where we housed the remote viewers that did in, the intelligence application work. Uh, and the numbers ranged anywhere from um, four or five up to about a, a dozen, depending on staffing, uh, <clears throat> administrative requirements, analysis had to be done, and so on. <clears throat> the building on the far right of the picture is the little building that we went to, into in order to do a so-called remote viewing session, which was relaxing, um, accepting the, ta the tasking, the queuing, again, double bond, but if there's an interviewer, that interviewer who, who uh, trumps the person that's relaxing to access whatever the data is you desire and is blind to the task, only the general nature of it. And of course, the, the individual attempting the process of remote viewing knows nothing about the, the outcome of the uh, He's not, it's totally blind. There may be a general idea, like if you have to find something or describe a distant scene, but beyond that, there's no information provided. Now, we had a number of um, senators that really took an interest in, a, in our activity. Senator Capel um, from Rhode Island was one of the biggest supporters, and some of you may be aware of the Capel um, uh, awards uh, that he hands out every year. Well, he's no longer alive. The Pell Grants that are available for students. I, that's, uh, I think that's me, I'm not sure anymore. <laughs> uh, so we did have a lot of uh, VIPs come up to see how we were doing. They would walk, would walk into the building and say, okay, I have a project for you. They dropped it right there on us, so that's putting the pressure on them. And occasionally we worked with the research people from SRI, that's Menlo Park, California, and people at Fort Meade, Maryland. Some people may have met Joe McMonico or read about him. That's him standing there <clears throat> on the right hand side of the picture. So we did joint projects, joint research, as well as operational uh, tasks that we came to us. So, what were the tasks? Well, generally, it's to find something. Something's missing. Is it a person? Is it an airplane? Whatever it is. Uh, everything else failed. Uh, this is sort of the court or the last resort. Can you guys help us out? Um, the other aspect of the work was remote site description. Uh, <clears throat> here's our queuing in, in a way of an abstract number. You tell us what's there. Uh, normally this is linked to a place in the Soviet Union uh, or even China or some other place, maybe an embassy somewhere. Any bad tradition. Here's a building. Now they don't know what the building is because it's double blind, but tell us what you think is going to be what is going on inside the Soviet building or wherever the country is. And again, we're working with communist countries, not the um, U.S. or um, friendly allies. <clears throat> so those are the general types of missions or tasks. I'm going to go through a few. The very first one uh, that the Foreign Technology Division, the very first operational Department of Defense project, <clears throat> for applying remote viewing is this one. Finding a Soviet bomber, the TU-22. Now this is an incredible story in, in a way. Uh, the pilot defected and just flew south as far as he could go until he ran out of gas, out of fuel. So the bomber crashed somewhere in Africa. And the minute we, it was being tracked, um, and the work we're now how does a Soviet bomber missing in Africa uh, get a team of people over here <clears throat> as fast as you can, find the bomber, extract the navigation gear, and get out of the country. Um, you, the, the, you can, Uganda, the, gover the government of Uganda did not know that a team of uh, Air Force analysts and CIA operatives were in country looking for the airplane. Well, this went on for about a week. Then pressure built up. 
You don't need to have an auto copter, you're not finding an airplane in the area where the pilot bailed out. So we were called in, the, the story of the last resort. Uh, there's rumors in FGD that I had a few new viewers. Could I use them, that person, whoever that was, to help locate the airplane? So I pulled aside this one woman that was very good describing distant scenes. She was a natural. Uh, and, and she sat down and relaxed in, in a cubby hole somewhere in the building and said, okay, the task is envision anything that's helpful for locating the missing airplane. I did show her a picture of the airplane. No other information. So after a while, <clears throat> she drew a sketch. She, she coming up here. There's uh, <clears throat> a sketch, and she thought it's come back now, it's overlaid and crashed down over the took down mountains. The sketch was passed on to the search team, and they said, well, that looks like it might be close. We'll have her work on the topographic map. That was phase two of the search protocol. The sketch, do what you can, and then if it doesn't have to be able to see if you match the perceptions even more accurately with the map. She came into the office, the maps on the wall, and she went over there, and uh, looked at her sketch and said, well, I think it's over there with that little X there, put an X on the, on the map. We said, we turned that into a coordinate, because that's the only way we could get the information to the field real quickly. We turned that into a coordinate, sent it to the field. The search team <clears throat> was way off to the right here, about 70, 60 miles away. They sent a helicopter. They had to get out of the next day. They sent a helicopter over to that area. When they landed, within a mile of where that X is, a native came out of the jungle carrying a piece of the record. So they were able to get the team in, extract the equipment, and get out of there you know, before the next day. Otherwise, they would have led to a, a major international group on it. We got the equipment. In the end, it's very difficult to find a plane like this smashed up in the jungle, but they found it. This, this became the highlight statement, a highlight example, when the program was released in 1995 by NBC, Ben Popper in Washington, D.C., it was the one that uh, revealed to the public, and that's me looking on uh, in the interview as I'm <coughs> describing the, the, the incident here. And President Carter got into the act um, a, a few weeks later, a few months later, <coughs> and said, Air Force is likely to find its missing Soviet plane in Africa. <clears throat> this is fine, but we didn't want a highly classified activity to get out to the public so quickly. So this had a negative effect on what we were doing. We really have to cut back on who knew what and where, including for congressional people that were known to be a little bit loose with their discussions in public. So I made quite a way of finding that. In fact, this particular project has been, this, this activity of Examined carefully by NSA, by CIA, every intelligence group you can think of, and it absolutely said, yes, you, you got the data there before any other information. And uh, your source, um, you did that to lead to the airplane. Now, I'm going to go to another example in terms of finding things. It's not just, we did other airplane searches, by the way, and then findings. But we also were brought in to look for fugitives. Here, here's an individual that the Customs Department came to us and said, this individual uh, opened up the door in a foreigner to let all kinds of drugs get through the Coast Guard. And, uh, but we, we wanted to catch, capture him, he learned that we were looking for him and took off. And we've been looking for him for three years and we can't find him, can you guys help us out? So we went into a, and the, the protocol that we followed, or this time we knew who we were looking for, here's the picture, where is he located now? And uh, I changed the tasking to say where where will he be when he can be found? Not where is he now, but where will he be when he can be found? Because he's on the move. Um, so I, that was the tasking. Where will he be when he can be found? Uh, one of the people that's really good at connecting with individuals um, came forth um, with information that said he's somewhere up in Wyoming, he may be moving very soon because he's near a campground. But on all kinds of descriptions that fit with the, with the Yellowstone area. We sent that to the field, and they alerted the police and the park rangers in that area. And sure enough, they located him. They located Charlie Jordan. And uh, this is a 
picture of it's the FBI <coughs> and the Secret Service and some of the customs people after they did a flyover to figure out how they're going to get Charlie Jordan out of that cabin, that trailer cabin in there, uh, which they succeeded. And here he is captured and being taken away. Now, this, this little exercise, and not big exercise actually, really got the attention. There was one of the items that was discussed during the Nightline release in 1995, and the BBC, a very interesting, in it, sent a team over to the US to replicate, to reenact the capture um, of Charlie Jordan. So I was able to recruit all the policemen in the county <coughs> that I lived in, Calvin County and Southern California, and, um, and they created a, uh, a simulation of capturing Charlie Jordan for the BBC broadcasting. Now, we did other things with people, too, in, in locating them. The case of General Dozier came up in 1981, and he was a, an Army general uh, at Verona, Italy. Uh, he was the commander of a NATO unit there, uh, a terrorist group called the Red Terrors, charged into the apartment building, uh, apartment room one night, and they threw him into some kind of a cane and carried him out. And before any of them worked it out, trying to flip an innocent past before his life broke free, he called for help. That had a big hunt went on. Um, where is Dozier? Can we locate Dozier? So we worked together with the Italian authorities and uh, the CIA and the NSA, and I got involved in that eventually, and it actually was sent into Italy as part of the search team to look for General Dozier. Uh, and this was based out of the Vicenza, an army base in North Italy. So this, this was about a 40 day, 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 a day long effort from the time he was captured until the time he was actually um, located exactly in an apartment for information from an informant. But while we were there, we did work with the remote viewing data. And we, through the remote viewing inputs that we were able to generate, we did identify pretty much where he was um, in Yoga. Italy, some of our sketches were closer than that, but even more so, details on an apartment building. He's in an apartment building above a grocery store. So we had very good data um, about his location, uh, which was helpful. It didn't lead to the actual rescue, but it showed the potential of how we could assist in finding people that are in, uh, in captive areas. Um, <clears throat> that was a picture of the actual location where he was kept captive. Now, a couple of months later, when Dozier was in, back in the U.S., I talked to him and I asked him what was going on and why he was kept, why, why he was captive for 44 days. And he said, well, about halfway through the captivity, he didn't think he'd get out of the line. So he and his wife, many years earlier, I had been familiar with Davy Ryan's work and ESP and that. We had a, a little bit of an interest in that topic. So he said he focused on a, a lighthouse, a flash of lights, <clears throat> to reach out to anybody out there that would get information about his location and somehow facilitate a search to free him because he really was not going to live more than a few uh, days or weeks at the most. So he was pretty convinced that his focus and his intention actually might have brought about some of the closure on, on the, the detail that we came up with. Now we worked on other hostages, some not as successful. We worked with the, with the uh, Israeli uh, intelligence group uh, when Lieutenant Colonel Higgins was captured by a terrorist group. They tracked him up, up uh, into Lebanon. Uh, there was a drone that we were working with the Israeli uh, intelligence people who were following that. Um, and we came close to finding him, but it was too late. One time, one, one evening, one of our uh, remote viewers said, well, it's too late, uh, he's not dead. And uh, we learned later that that was the night when he, had, he died. Now, not all of that is tragic sometimes, but when we try to determine a hostage location, or even the state of health of the hostage, uh, which came up <clears throat> several times during the Iranian crisis, when the, the 56 um, Iranian uh, 
U.S. Embassy people in, uh, in um, Iran were held captive. Uh, remember that episode in 44 days uh, before they were finally released and President Carter um, you know, was no longer in office. But halfway through that captivity, one of our people said, uh, we were doing a routine check on the hostages. <clears throat> and the input was, um, I see a hostage that's very ill. He's going to be released in about two or three days. And we're not going to describe details <clears throat> about the individual and the, and the physical condition, which is dire. Uh, we put that information together and sent it to medical people, transferred that to Frankfurt, Germany, where the, uh, the people who would be coming out, if ever, from, from the roof, from the Iran, would be sent for medical checkup. And three days later, uh, three days later, Cream, Richard Cream was released unexpectedly. And uh, the only one that was released early. And when we talked to him later, uh, he said, I don't, I don't know how you guys did this because you, get, you had data that nobody else could have known. And we thought, we thought that you had a bug inside of the embassy and tracking us. Now we did other things in terms of predicting uh, the equipment. Uh, this is an artist's rendering of a very large submarine. It's not the actual one, but one of the activities that we got into was what is inside this huge this building that's being constructed? It's not even near water. Uh, no one would have thought that there was a, a submarine in there. But the individual that worked on this, and some of you may have heard of Joe Gonzalez, he's very good. And he comes up with a sketch of a really large submarine and that's going to be released in about one month. And sure enough, about one month later, there it is floating around in the bay. So uh, we went over with other details as well. Uh, <clears throat> the, uh, there was really attention to the big subs in that, that were being built in that room. Uh, railroad track showed up later, uh, which is how they converted down to the water. <clears throat> Now, some of the things we did were not just equipment oriented like that, but also advanced developments. Uh, and one example uh, that the, the remote viewer came up with and cast for a, a remote site in uh, Russia, actually out in the middle of Siberia somewhere. And <clears throat> what he came up with is just nothing but these little curvy lights. You know, it didn't, it didn't look like much. You know, that's not much of a session. The data. So looking at it from the, the analysis point of view, which is the role I tended to play, was I said, oh, you're, you're telling me there's, there's a laser being tested in there. And um, maybe they're building a blue laser uh, system in that facility. And um, we passed that information on. But the only logical conclusion that I could draw at that time based on that data is either good or it's either nothing or it's correct. And about a six to nine months later, um, that facility has a, it appears to be a large dome, and a little later, we get information that uh, they are actually building a, a laser tracking facility there using blue light, uh, which is good for tracking up into the satellites or in submarines, submarines, submarines. Some of the most interesting projects were was the Coast Guard, uh, working with the Coast Guard drug addiction. Um, and these got a little testy because we were actually in different facilities uh, working with the Coast Guard people um, tracking and trying to analyze the communications that they were getting and coming up with predictions. Mm -hmm. Is that ship loaded or not? Uh, where is that ship going? So we did quite a few projects with the Navy later, uh, and they were, the Coast Guard was actually able to direct resources, fly over take a look at that spot down there that they thought the ship would be at. And sure enough, that's where it was. They sent the Coast Guard boat over there to board it. And very often, as the Coast Guard ship approached, you see all these bales being thrown over the top. <laughs> in fact, and a bunch of them floated up in Cape Cod, <clears throat> and we were able to backtrack, considering the tide and the wind, and it coincided almost exactly where that ship was a week or two earlier. Um, we were in Alameda Island, San Francisco, um, and not only were there drugs coming in that we were able to have an idea of uh, pinpoint, but also animal parts, um, illegal things like that, animals. We were at Key West for a while, uh, Paso, Texas, working on the top.
trouble with Amish. Yeah. Now, the one project I'm going to spend a little time on is the old salt. And one of the old ships, uh, her name is, this one was called the Old Salt. Um, and the information we had from Hong Kong was that the ship, the cargo, an old cargo ship, Old Salt, uh, just to the left port. And we think from the intelligence data from Hong Kong, it's loaded with narcotics. And this is past the Coast Guard. So the Coast Guard started tracking it, and they lost it. They lost track. A year later, this ship has not shown up. Where is Old Salt? Did it sink? Is it in port somewhere? It's being repainted and renamed and given a new flag? Or is it moving? Where is Old Salt? Now, this is the entire Pacific Ocean that we're dealing with. From Hong Kong to Chile to California. You know, so where? You know, look. They, they tried to find it. I mean, said they had no one they don't want it. They didn't want to do this project. You know, this, this sounded almost too impossible in, in an area where we are working with impossible things. But it was impossible. So we, I called on the woman that was really good at finding things. And uh, she, she relaxed me into her, her mode of perception. And, uh, yeah, and, and we were working with this for the entire Pacific Ocean map. So we knew what we were looking for. We knew the curious area. So she finally came up with a feeling and, and put the marker on the map. So well, right here. So we passed that coordinate on to the Coast Guard in Kenyuri, uh, Oregon. Uh, this is the closest spot. And the Coast Guard in, in Kenyuri, uh, uh, Oregon, the Navy Station, had a patrol plane flying around, <coughs> routine patrol. And he said, well, I said, uh, if you have enough fuel, go north to 50 degrees, north 30, west, whatever the number is. Take a look, see what you can find, and see if anything's there. So they went up there, and sure enough, there's the old salt. <laughs> Almost exactly what they had. And, and by, the time, by the time the Coast Guard got the ship going, the, uh, the, the interception ship, this is initially an airplane, uh, I did it. So it's moved over another 50 miles. But they were still able to track it and get close enough. And as they get close enough, and the people on the old salt start throwing off bales and things. Okay, well, the Coast Guard got out the old correct place to stop that action. They got on board uh, and made sure they were throwing more bales and dumped out of the board. But somebody on the crew of the old salt set a fire alarm off in the engine compartment. So now they had to put a fire alarm in the old salt. So now it was operating. So the Coast Guard took it up with whatever cables they had, started towing it back in Hawaii, 500 miles further south. As they're towing it, the ship took on board and sank. <laughs> so if somebody wants to have 10 tons of narcotics, I can tell you exactly where the point is. And you can go diving, there's 5,000 feet of water if you want to. The fish down there are pretty hard. So we got a, a very special accommodation from the Coast Guard plan to the Pacific Ocean. And then, and then at one time, <clears throat> I had this option given to me. <clears throat> would you rather be in Florida or would you rather be in Moscow for the winter? Well, I'm not too much of a fan of Florida, so I'll take Moscow. And that was my next place where I was going to be going to Moscow for, for the winter months. <clears throat> in 1973 to 1974 as part of a CIA State Department mission to find the bugs in the new U.S. Embassy building <coughs> that was being constructed in Oshkosh at that time. And uh, this mission had nothing to do with Stargate, but if one got there, why not use some of the Stargate information to see what they can add to where the bugs might be when you get there and you can look at that spot to see if that's really what, what you could see. Uh, to their perception. Now, this particular assignment came to me not because I wanted it, but I was the only individual in the agency that had a reputation for being nuts in the wintertime by going camping in the snow and mountain climbing. So they figured I was trying to get that right fit in here. But even, even so, I had to go to technical firing school for uh, two or three weeks. 
That's quite challenging when you jump off a, a cliff. You're just a rope. I go to Los Alamos National Laboratory in New Mexico to take part in the development of a really strong X-ray device. Because that's how they, they're going to look for bugs in the in the embassy that's being built. They're going to X-ray the cement floor. Any client standing on my side. That's why I'm looking at a tree line to sign them to. And we field tested everything on the mountaintop uh, above Los Alamos, which was a really fun night. We went there to pretend 